Realms of the Haunting is one of the more interesting first-person shooters to come out of the 90s. Interesting in a number of ways, largely for the way it blended first-person shooting with the point-and-click gameplay of many adventure games from the same period. And also for its very story-orientated and cinematic storyline, which was something not really being done in FPS games at the time. There are powers working here that would ensure that you fail in this quest and desire you humiliated and dead beside. Developed by Gremlin Interactive, it was released in 1997 for the PC exclusively. Help. You take on the role of a dude named Adam Randall, venturing into a mysterious haunted house as he searches for clues about his father's death. Turns out there's a lot more here going on than meets the eye, and Adam soon finds himself caught up in a huge battle between the forces of good and evil. Visually, this looks like a game made in 1997 through and through. The environments are built with the game's 3D engine, while sprites are used for almost everything else. That doesn't mean it's bad, in fact it's still quite a good looking game with a great art style. There's a lot of detail packed into the environment, and there's also a great variety in textures from area to area. The lighting is moody and atmospheric, and it's still pretty damn impressive when you walk into a darkened room and flick on a light switch or light a candle. This is definitely a spooky game in terms of its visuals and plot, and I know I'm not the only one who had a few sleepless nights this game in their younger years. Being that there's such a huge focus on the story, you can't play for more than 5 or 10 minutes without having to sit through a cinematic that often goes on just as long. Characters are introduced rapidly in the first few chapters of the game, and they've all got their own motives which you'll have to discover as you play through the game. Who are you? What do you want? About a quarter ways into the game, and you meet a woman named Rebecca, who ends up helping you in your quest, even tag along with you throughout the game. Though all this really means is that she appears alongside you in the cinematics and offers up some advice here and there during certain puzzles in the form of a simple voiceover. Where are you? I am imprisoned. Another cool feature was how you could often choose how each cinematic would play out by choosing from one of several possible responses. Often these responses wouldn't really have any effect, but there were certain occasions where the way you talk to someone could result in them giving you helpful information or say in the instance that you pissed them off, they could just outright kill you. There really is a great sense of polish in some of these cutscenes, and they are written well enough that you don't find yourself dozing off too often. And even if you do, they're thankfully skippable. And to top it all off, I've just had a riveting conversation with my father. And normally that would be great. Except he's dead. I don't want to spoil the story for anyone. In fact, I'm worried about showing cinematics in this game in the first place. But I will say that it is pretty engaging stuff, even if it can be a bit cheesy at times. Now I said before that Realms of the Haunting is a mix of shooting and puzzle solving and that's really the best way to sum it all up. When you're not shooting at something, you're clicking at something in the game world, trying to unlock a door or figure out the way forward. Initially about 90% of the house is locked and unreachable, but as you move through the story, it slowly unlocks new areas and you'll soon find yourself filling in all corners of the map as you explore every little nook and cranny. The way it all flows is pretty seamless and the overall design and layout isn't too hard to come to grips with. The game even gives you a map for most locations anyway, so navigating shouldn't be too tricky. I'm not going to lie though, this is a hard game. Some of the puzzles aren't entirely obvious and you quite often have to read and investigate every little thing you pick up through your inventory screen, as it's often the only way to figure out where or how to use a particular item. You can switch between a hard and easy mode, which will make using items a lot easier, as it will simply use the correct item in the correct place when required. The game is broken up into 20 or so chapters and I should mention that it can often move on to the next chapter regardless of whether or not you've picked up all the necessary items you'll need for the ensuing chapters. It's entirely possible to do certain things out of order and then just be totally lost and confused. Also a lot of the time when you finish a chapter the game requires you to backtrack for a good 5 or 10 minutes to a new area that you've just unlocked. You're always constantly having to remember where you've been and keep it in the back of your mind when you're trying to figure out where to go next. There's also a fair bit of platforming to be done as well, aside from a few mazes the player has to navigate to find a series of items. So overall, it's suitably challenging stuff and will definitely give most people a real run for their money. Certain errors also only give you a limited margin of error for puzzle solving and will outright kill you if you screw up. But I don't think there was ever a time where the puzzle was difficult to the point that I was completely stumped, and you can save and load your game at any time throughout the inventory screen, which is pretty damn forgiving when you think about it. The further you get into the game, the harder the puzzles get, and also the stronger the monster and enemies become. Early on, you're really only up against a couple of enemy types that kind of slowly plod towards you for a melee attack, giving you a huge window to kill them. 
There's all manner of monsters and demons that come after you, including these weird looking men in black type guys with dual pistols and glowing eyes. Adam starts out with a pistol himself before getting his hands on a sword, shield and shotgun. From there you also get some more inventive magical based weapons like a staff that charges up to fire off damaging blasts of energy, a blunderbuss and even eventually a magic wand. These magic type weapons all regenerate their ammunition over time when you're not using them, which is handy because ammo for the more traditional weapons is always in short supply, along with healing potions. Aiming is a matter of rotating your view with the keyboard and then clicking on the enemy with the left mouse button. You can freely move the crosshair around the screen as you see fit. It's not shooting in the traditional sense, but it does give you a lot more freedom and accuracy with firing weapons. Now whilst these weapons are fun to use and all look and sound really cool, the issue is that they're just not that effective, as is combat in general to be honest. Enemies aren't really that much of a threat, in fact you can easily run right past them about 90% of the time. Some of the enemies later in the game can fire projectiles at you, but most of the time they'll be dead long before they're close enough to be any real threat. But there are times when you do have to kill them to progress, and it's at these moments where the shooting just feels flat. Even with some of the game's more damaging weapons, it can take more than a few blasts to put them down. I mean, something like a shotgun should be brutal at close range, but it can often take a good 8 or 9 hits to take down certain enemies. Even the so-called weaker enemies can often require, say, 3 to 5 point-blank shots. The only time you'll ever find yourself killing them is when you're trying to explore a new area for items. You have to press the page up or page down buttons to adjust your view and pick up items on the ground. And that's usually around the time when an enemy comes out of nowhere and starts attacking you from the back. As a result, shooting becomes something of a rare necessity more than it does form the foundation of the gameplay. But having said that, it's really hard to find reasons to not recommend this game to people. I guess one of the biggest factors is how archaic the controls and visuals are. On that note, you're not even able to change the controls from the default scheme, which kind of sucks. But these are the kind of things you can get used to over time. Also, another thing that might turn off certain players is the constant amount of cinematics in the game. You will spend, you know, 20 minutes playing through a level and having a good old time, but you will also spend another 5 or 10 minutes after that watching a really long cinematic. If you're not invested in the story, then you're not going to be too interested in, well, you know, anything the game has to offer. Skipping needs is all fine and dandy, but the problem with that is that Adam will often talk about what he has to do next in the middle of them. And if you skip them, you obviously have no clue where the hell you're supposed to go. Look, I don't understand what this is all about, this you must know. Overall though, the positives really outweigh the negatives, and for all its annoyances with confusing level design, Realms of the Haunting is still a very entertaining and superbly written action, horror and adventure game, with some clever puzzles and inventive weapons. I picked up my version on goodoldgames.com and it runs pretty much flawlessly in DOSBox, with very little sound or graphical errors whatsoever. The thing about sites like goodoldgames.com is that they offer gamers easy and working access to some of the greatest games of yesteryear. Games that people missed out on for various reasons and should definitely check out. And at the end of the day, Realms of the Haunting is one of those games. Well, we still have the Shrive. The last will be back for that. Yeah. Can't wait to see his tan. <laughs> <laughs>